and welcome to Cerebrophile. I am Miss Raz, and these are my big hands. And here, we talk about all things cerebral, while I do a drawing inspired by our cerebral topic of the day. Today is part two of Phantom Limb. Phantom. Phantom. If you haven't watched part one, go and watch that first. There'll be a card or a link somewhere. For those of you who've already watched part one, just a quick refresher. Remember we talked about Tom. And what was curious about Tom? Tom could feel his phantom thumb and his phantom pinky when you touched his cheek and you touched his chin. That's good old Tom. And who was the person that he was hanging out with? V.S. Ramachandran, the wonderful neuroscientist and person with an awesome name. We also discussed the homunculus. Remember him? Yeah. Huge hands, huge mouth. Why? Because these areas have a lot of real estate in the somatosensory cortex of the brain. This is the part of your brain that takes all of the touchy touchy sensory things from your body up to your brain for processing. Now we have a new curious case. His name is Philip, another one of V.S. Ramachandran's patients from his wonderful book, Phantoms in the Brain. Go buy it. Philip was on his motorcycle going down the freeway, wind in his hair. No, it wasn't. He was wearing a helmet, which you always should if you're ever on a motorcycle or a bicycle. Be safe. And he was just, you know, enjoying the breeze and all that good stuff. And he got into an accident, was hurled off of his motorcycle going down that freeway. He, unlike Tom from before, he actually did not lose his arm. It was still attached, but the nerves that go from the arm to the spinal cord and the brain, they were like literally like, like just ripped off. When the sensory nerve is ripped off of the spinal cord, that's called an evulsion. And in Philip's case, this is called a brachial evulsion because it is the brachial nerve from his arm. His arm was in a sling for a year before he finally decided, you know what, let's just amputate it. It didn't work anymore. It was never gonna work. And it was just kind of in the way and cumbersome. So he had it amputated, but this did not stop Philip. Philip even became an amazing one-armed pool player, a little pool shark. So much so that he got the nickname, the one-armed bandit. 10 years later, he ends up in V.S. Ramachandran's office complaining of pain in his elbow and his hand, and also experiencing phantom limb paralysis to where his non-existent hand is just like stuck in some uncomfortable position and he wants it to move, won't move. This is a little bit different from Tom in that Tom did not experience phantom paralysis. He still kind of felt like he could wiggle his fingers. Now, why would some people experience phantom pain while others don't? There's a huge variety in the experiences of people with phantom limb. There is some speculation that if the limb was somehow in pain or paralyzed before the amputation, that that memory kind of persists and sticks with you. There was a story of a soldier who had a grenade in his hand and he was clinching it and was about to throw it when it detonated and blew up his hand. And his phantom pain was related to this clinching feeling of clinching on to that grenade, the subsequent pain of it exploding in his hand. A woman with chillblains, which is this kind of like type of frostbite, she had it when she was really young in her like thumb and fingers and she had to remove the thumb because it was gangrenous. Gangrene was a big issue back in the day, y'all. Still can be, be careful. So she'd had her thumb removed and still up until her old age when the weather would change, she would feel like arthritis in her thumb joint. There was another story of a cardiologist who had Berger's disease, which causes like the blood vessels to swell. And he had these horrible pulsating pains in his legs. The pain was so bad that he decided to have his leg amputated. Before he went under for surgery, he asked the surgeon, could you put that in a jar for me? You know, pickle it, formaldehyde so I can take it home. And the guy was like, Okay, rather strange request, but uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. No problem, doctor. After he got his surgery, everything was good. He didn't have the pain. He was thrilled. And he would look at his pickled leg and be like, ha ha, I got rid of you, yes. But unfortunately, the leg had the last laugh. Within a few weeks, he started to experience the pain again in his legs, and he would still look at his amputated leg floating in the formaldehyde it seemed to look back and mock him for all of his attempts to try to rid himself of it. A few more examples of phantom discomforts. You could also have phantom spasming, so the hand just kind of 
clenches and like the nails dig into the palm. They can feel it and you can't unclench it. Gosh, that even hurts just trying. Once somebody had their foot amputated, but before they had it amputated, they had an ingrown toenail. Ingrown toenail, that like phantom pain persisted for years after the leg was amputated. Now with all these stories, we seem to hear about a lot of stories of phantom pain and discomfort and most people want to, you know, rid themselves somehow of their phantom limb. This is not always the case though. Sometimes phantoms can actually be kind of helpful, such as the case with some people and prosthetics. In Dr. Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Took His Wife for a Hat, which if you have not seen that video, there will be a card or something somewhere, go watch that. In his book, he discusses people with phantom limbs and their use of prosthetics. All amputees and those who work with them know a phantom limb is essential if an artificial limb is to be used. Dr. Michael Kremerson writes, its value to the amputee is enormous. I am quite certain that no amputee with an artificial lower limb can walk on it satisfactorily until the body image, in other words, the phantom, is incorporated into it. This is kind of suggesting that a person who has a phantom limb and wears a prosthetic, that they cannot effectively embody that prosthetic until their phantom embodies that prosthetic. Sometimes phantoms need to be woken up so they can be incorporated into like the body image and the body schema. Oliver Sacks describes another patient. He must wake up his phantom in the mornings. First, he flexes his stump towards him several times, and then he slaps it sharply like a baby's bottom several times. On the fifth or sixth slap, the phantom shoots forth, finally rekindled. Only then can he put on his prosthetic and walk. What other odd methods one wonders are used by amputees? Oh, Oliver. Frequently people confuse divergences and differences from the norm as pathological or disease. Just think about the word disease. Dis-ease. To be uneasy because something is probably bothering you. But Oliver Sacks, always being that kind of person to wonder is this pathology or not, says, There is a certain confusion about phantoms, whether they should occur or not, whether they are pathological or not, whether they are real or not. The literature is confusing, but patients are not. And they clarify matters by describing different sorts of phantoms. Thus, a clear-headed man with an above-the-knee amputation describes this to me. There's this thing, this ghost foot, which sometimes hurts like hell, and the toes curl up, or go into spasm. The worst is at night, or when the prosthesis is off, or when I'm not doing anything. It goes away when I strap the prosthesis on and walk. I still feel the leg then, vividly, but it's a good phantom, different. It animates the prosthesis and allows me to walk. So phantom limbs can be a good thing and can help animate your new prosthetic limb. Now, if you were missing a limb and you were in a prosthetic, how do you think that phantom limb would fit into said prosthetic? You would kind of assume if it was your hand, it would fit in like a glove, or if it was your foot, it would fit in like a good shoe. Not always so. Some people with phantom limb describe their limbs as too long, too short, or even telescopic. One such case was that of Mary Bell. Mary Bell contacted Vias from a Chandran and she walks into his office and he's like, oh, you know, where are you from? And uh, what did you study in school? What are your interests? And Mary Bell apparently quickly lost interest and she was like, what do you really wanna know? You wanna know about my phantoms, right? Cut the crap. Sassy pants. Mary Bell was born without arms, so she didn't lose anything, she just was born without arms, which is already curious. You can have phantom limbs, even though you never had a limb to haunt you. So Vias Ramachandran was a little skeptical. How do you know you have phantoms? Because I'm talking to you and they're gesticulating and pointing just like your arms would. Then she follows up with, but my phantoms are actually about six to eight inches too short. He asked her, well, how do you know they're too short? And she said that when she uses her prosthetic limbs, when she puts her arms into them, her phantom hand should fit into the phantom fingers just like a glove, but it doesn't because her phantom is about six inches too short. She even asked her prosthetist to shorten her limbs so that her artificial limbs more closely matched the length of her phantom limbs. Another interesting case of that of John, a tennis player who lost his arm, but his phantom was telescopic. It could like reach far beyond what a normal arm could reach. And of course, Vias Ramachandran's like, how far can it reach? Could it reach to the moon? So to kind of 
test this because V.S. Ramachandran loves to throw in quick little experiments. He offers John a cup of coffee right as John is reaching for it with his phantom arm, which is still a little confusing to me. He's reaching for it and V.S. Ramachandran just yanks that coffee cup away from him. And John goes, ow, that hurt. I had just gotten my fingers around the little holder thing. Don't do that. Because from a channel was like, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. I will not do that again. But back to phantom pain that's not caused by yanking cups out of phantom hands. But what about that pain that is just persistent and has no obvious source? Or that paralysis where it's just stuck in one position and you can't unclench it? Or what about the fact that someone like Mary Bell never actually experienced any sort of pain and she, her arms, her phantoms were not paralyzed at all. What's going on? I'm gonna leave you to think about that for a little bit here while I work on my painting. Roll the time lapse. Welcome back. Did you come up with any ideas? Any phantom hypotheses? You know what time it is. It's time to bring out the brain. People like Mary Bell maybe don't experience phantom pain and phantom paralysis because they did not have a feedback loop to break in the first place. Feedback loops? Yes, a feedback loop. What is a feedback loop? Let's discuss. Think of everything that goes in to having your arm move. What has to happen? You have a thought, right? I'd really like to move my arm right now. I have an itch on my leg and I really need to scratch it. Move the arm. So first, prefrontal cortex says, let's move. Then it goes to an area over here and you might be thinking, somatosensory cortex. Very good, you remember the last video, but that is not actually where this command is going. Somatosensory cortex is involved with receiving information from the body. If you were to touch something on your hand, that information would go here and you would process it. The thought to move your arm goes to another area very, very close by called the motor cortex. The motor cortex is located just in front of the somatosensory cortex. There's also the supplementary motor cortex, which is a little bit further in front. The motor cortex does simpler commands while the supplementary cortex handles more complex movements. So these messages go from the frontal cortex to the motor cortex to the supplementary motor cortex, and finally exit out through this tiny, tiny, your spinal cord. The nerves that are coming out of the brain through the spinal cord that go out to the body, those are called efferent nerves. Efferent nerves are the ones that carry messages from the brain through your body and send out commands. Through the efferent nerve that goes from the spinal cord, it is literally electrified and it goes into your muscles, it's called innervating, and it basically makes them go bzz, 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 and it makes them move. Amazing. So the message starts in the prefrontal cortex, goes to the motor cortex, then to the supplementary motor cortex, then goes down through your spinal cord and down into your arm, telling it, move. Amazing. End of story, right? No. You can't just send commands all willy-nilly all over the place without somebody checking in on them. You gotta check to make sure they're being done correctly. Let's say I'm trying to pick up this paintbrush. Pretend I'm not holding it with my other hand. This hand has to come in and grab it. There's information going to my hand to grab the paintbrush, but there's also information from this hand going to my brain. Those nerves are called afferent. I am so sorry, I don't know who named these. Afferent nerves are the ones that carry information from the body up to the brain. Those afferent nerves are going to take information back to the brain to give it some feedback. See the feedback loop? 
Those afferent nerves are carrying information back to the parietal lobe, all this good stuff right here, it includes the somatosensory cortex, and to the cerebellum, which is related to movement. Those areas are basically checking. Did everything go according to plan? This is where the idea of a feedback loop comes from. You send the message, it goes down, and as you're executing it, you also have information coming back up for you to check if the command that you sent out is being executed accordingly. Surely there's been a time that you went to go lift something and you thought it was gonna be really heavy only to find out it's light and you were like, Whoa! or think of a time that maybe somebody was handing you something and you didn't think it was gonna be so heavy and you were like, Whoa! These feedback loops ensure that you can keep track of what you're doing and adjust accordingly if need be. As with much in the brain and the mysteries of the body, this is not the whole story either. It's not just a matter of your touch receptors and your muscles working. There's other places you can get input. Go and look up a video about the rubber hand illusion. There is a hand and there's also another hand. This also can even work with something as tiny as a Barbie doll hand. This hand would stay on the desk and your hand would end up hiding underneath, but it's directly underneath. The experimenter would then take something like a paintbrush and very carefully would start stroking the rubber hand as well as your hand under the table. So you're feeling the sensation, but you're seeing this fake hand in front of you. Now, after a person does this for a little while and you are feeling the sensation and seeing the sensation, you start to kind of link the two together. So much so that the experimenter continues on with the nice brushing with the paintbrush and then all of a sudden <laughs> smashes the hand with a hammer. The rubber hand, not your hand. But can you imagine what most people do? <laughs> They freak out and swear that they feel the pain in their hand. If you have enough sensory input from the touching with the paintbrush and you can see that visual input, that visual input is enough to kind of override the obvious knowledge that that is not your arm. Look at our brain again. How much area is dedicated just to vision? This whole chunk back here, this occipital low, we're highly visual creatures. How does the rubber hand illusion relate to what we're talking about with phantom limb? Let's get back to phantom limb pain and what can be done about it by incorporating vision and some ingenious little techniques. According to Vias Ramachandran, the command is monitored by the parietal lobe, but this time it does not receive the proper visual feedback. The visual system says, nope, arm's not moving. The command is sent out again, arm, move. Nope. The visual feedback returns informing the brain repeatedly that the arm is not moving. Eventually the brain learns that the arm does not move and a kind of learned paralysis is stamped into the brain. The scientific community is still not sure why this happens, but they do believe that this may be related to why people experience paralysis in their phantoms and occasional pain. Now we obviously cannot give feedback to a hand that's not there. We may be able to get some information into the brain via a different pathway, peepers. This is where Vyas Ramachandran shines and comes up with his ingenious invention. It's called the mirror box. It consists of a box and right in between the box is a mirror. You put in your good hand and your stump into one side and right in the middle is a mirror that's facing my good hand. So if I were to look into the box like this, I see a perfect reflection, a mirror, of this hand. So if your phantom limb is always clenched like this, and you obviously can't move it because it's phantom, you have your good hand, you put them both in the box. Remember, this hand does not exist, but this is what that hand is doing. This hand, you open up and you just relax it and you move it around, clench it and then let it relax. Now you look into the mirror and you'll see this, and somehow the brain, because of the visual input, allows the hand to relax. Re-enter Philip. Philip was the one who was hurled off his motorcycle on the freeway and ended up having his arm amputated and he was still experiencing a lot of pain in his phantom elbow and his phantom wrist. So Vias Ramachandran tells him, put both of your arms into the box and move them. And Philip's like, oh I can't do that. No, my, my hands don't work. I mean I can move my right hand but you know my left hand doesn't work. Try it anyway. Philip puts his hands in there and he's looking into the mirror. Oh my god! Oh my god! Doc! Doc, this is unbelievable. It's mind boggling. My left arm, it's like it's plugged in again. Okay, wonderful, now now close your eyes. Oh man, it's frozen again. Like I can feel my right hand moving, but my left is seized up again. Open your eyes. It's moving again. Now everyone is mildly impressed, as you would be. And Vias Ramachandran's like, 
Are you willing to take it home with you and practice? And Philip is like, dude, yeah, sure, absolutely. Oh my God, like, I am just so happy to be moving my phantom again at all, even if it's just for a little bit. So he takes it home. A week later, Ramachandran's like, what is happening? How is it going? And Philip's like, oh man, it's so fun, doc. I use it for 10 minutes every day. Put my hand in there, wave it around to see how it feels. Girlfriend and I play with it. It's very enjoyable. But when I close my eyes, it still doesn't work. And if I don't use the mirror, it doesn't work. I know you want my fan to start moving again, but without the mirror, it doesn't. Three more weeks go by. And again, Ramachandran's like, how's it going? What's happening? This time, Philip's like, oh my God, Doc, it's gone, it's gone. What's gone, the box? Did you lose it? No, my phantom, it's gone. What are you talking about? You know that phantom arm I've had for like 10 years? It's gone, it is gone. Except I still have some phantom fingers dangling from my shoulder. And Ramachandran's immediate reaction was like, oh my God, I've just changed his like mental body image. So he asked him like, uh, how has this affected your mental well-being? Are you upset about this at all or anything? Does it bother you, Philip? No, 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 on the contrary. You know that excruciating pain I used to have on my phantom for like, it would bother me like multiple times a week in my elbow, it's gone. Ramachandra, I'm sure was just like, Whew. But of course he had to wonder like, why did just the fingers persist? Remember the cortical homunculus? Look at how big of an area the hand has. So maybe it was just resistant to that change. After all this with Philip, Dr. Ramachandran realized this might be the first time in history that anybody has successfully amputated a phantom limb. Mirrorbox visual therapy treatments have been used with people with phantom limb as well as stroke patients with weakened limbs and some learned paralysis. Some of the research that's been done on mirrorbox therapy has been contested that maybe only some of the hundred or so studies were actually valid. However, compared to many other types of treatment that can be invasive or expensive, this is fairly inexpensive, fairly ininvasive, and probably wouldn't hurt. Most people can agree that maybe it won't work for everybody, but it can most certainly help a good handful of people and it wouldn't hurt to try. The mirror box is a wonderful example of a beautiful, simple, elegant little design that can have dramatic effects for some people's lives. And that is the end of Phantom Limb Part Two. And here is our final result. We have our phantom limb, then we have our good arm, the left arm, and if we look into the mirror, we can see a reflection of the right hand, thus giving the illusion that you're looking at your right hand. This provides the visual feedback the brain is craving and for some people can have wonderful results that finally can unclench the hand that has gripped them for so many years. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Like, comment, subscribe, all those lovely things if you'd like to see more. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you again. And until then, be peaceful, be present, be grateful. See y'all next time. Bye. Avulsion. Avulsion. There have been stories of shul. There have been stories of soldier. Soldiers. Soldiers. Chillblains. Chillblains. Chill Blames. Chill Blames. How you doing? I'm Chill Blames. Prosthesist. Prosthetist. 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 Whoo. G'day. G'day.